right, guys, welcome back to the Road to Success MCAT Test Prep Series. In this video, I will be talking about the nervous system and how it affects biology, as opposed to psychology, in which it's usually discussed. This is one of my favorite videos I'm going to be making about the MCAT, as it covers a lot of interesting topics that I personally find very interesting. I'll be starting off with the anatomy and physiology of the neuron, and I'll follow up by applying it to the action potential. Action potentials are essentially our electric impulses in our brain that deliver various signals throughout our body. I will also be talking about the various divisions of the nervous system that are present in our body. Stuff like the autonomic nervous system, somatic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, etc, etc. I will be finishing this up with a very quick discussion about what a reflex arc is and its significance inside our body. I'm super excited to talk to you guys about this uh, topic, and I'm very excited for you guys to learn. So that being said, let's jump into it and start talking about the anatomy of the neuron. All right, starting off, I will be talking about the anatomy of the neuron and the glia. So neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system. They are your nerve cells, and they are used to uh, accept and relay signals from the brain all the way down to a muscle cell or a gland basically any effector that needs a signal to be propagated. So starting off, I'm going to uh, uh, circle three main parts of the neuron, which will be the dendrite, cell body, or the soma, and the axon. I don't want to block that. So anyways, the dendrite is the receiver of the cell, where it receives neurotransmitters or signals from the presynaptic branch of an axon from another uh, neuron. The dendritic branches will then relay the signal all the way to the soma. Once it reaches the soma, the nucleus will process it, send it to the endoplasmic articulum, the Golgi apparatus, etc., etc., and it'll eventually it'll start to propagate responsive signals in the axon hillock. The axon hillock is basically where you propagate enough signals to uh, signal that you need to send out an action potential. Action potentials are how neurons send their signals. These are electrical signals that shoot out through the axon all the way to the synaptic terminal. Once it reaches the synaptic terminals, it'll open up calcium channels to allow uh, neurotransmitters to enter vesicles. And once they enter the vesicles, they will go through the synaptic terminal from the presynaptic axons to the postsynaptic dendrites. Moving on, I would like to talk to you guys about glia. Glia are like the support cells of the nervous system. Everything they do is to support neurons and propagation of action potentials. Astrocytes nourish neurons and they form the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier controls the transmission of solutes from the bloodstream into nervous tissue. Ependymal cells line the ventricles of the brain, and they produce cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. CSF physically supports the brain, and it serves as a shock barrier. Microglia are phagocytic cells that ingest and break down waste products and pathogens in the central nervous system. And finally, we have oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. These produce myelin around axons. I want to point out the, that the oligo, oligodendrocytes work only in the central nervous system, while Schwann cells work in the peripheral nervous system. Moving on, let's talk about the action potential. The action potential neurons use all or nothing messages to relay electrical impulses down the axon to the synaptic uh, terminal. So, with that being said, I want to talk to you guys about the resting potential and how it changes over time as you reach uh, depolarization, hyperpolarization, basically how you send the action potential. So a cell's resting membrane potential is the net electric potential difference that exists across the cell membrane. This is created by movement of charged molecules across that membrane. For, neuro for neurons, it's around 70 mil uh, millivolts. So that's the resting membrane potential. 
The two most important ions involved in generating and maintaining this resting potential are potassium and sodium. Now, this diagram right here essentially breaks down what happens for the sodium and potassium to maintain the resting membrane potential of negative 70. Sodium is very positive. It has a membrane potential of about 60 millivolts. Potassium, on the other hand, very negative, negative, sorry, negative 90 millivolts. Now, as you can see right here, the resting membrane potential is much closer to potassium than it is to sodium's membrane potential. This means that the resting membrane potential and the cell itself prefers to have more potassium in than sodium. And that's where the sodium potassium pump comes in. The purpose of the sodium potassium pump is to pump in two potassiums while pumping out three sodiums. So I'll write it down here. So three sodium out, two potassium in. Basically, they're sending out more potassium or more sodium than they're sending in potassium. Meaning, or sorry, there's more, uh, I, I just confused myself there for a second, but uh, they're sending out more sodium and they're sending in potassium. So as there's more potassium in here, it'll be closer to the resting membrane potential of potassium, which is negative 90. That being said, there's, there isn't a complete lack of sodium inside the cell, so there still will be some sodium there, leading to a slightly, uh, a slightly increased resting membrane potential, which will end up being around negative 70. That being said, let's move on to how it all changes. When, you, uh, when the axon hillock sends the action potential, or when it's uh, receiving action potential, or uh, signals, sorry, it's when it's receiving signals, eventually it will reach a threshold where it'll be able to send the axon potential. Right here, that's where it's gonna be sending the signal. Once that happens, sodium channels will start to open. Leading to a lot of depolarization. Once it reaches the, t the peak right here, that's when the action potential is released. So this entire part right here is uh, reaching that threshold. And then once it, the action potential is fired, if there's no more subsequent stimulus, it'll start to repolarize. This is where potassium channels open. I want to point out that at the action potential right here, assuming there is no more stimulus, the sodium channels will close. Once it reaches uh, here, which is the resting membrane potential, it'll actually shoot a little bit under and go through what is called hyperpolarization. Here, the re, uh, the re, uh, the restoration of the original membrane potential, moving back up here, is called uh, entering or exiting a refractory period. There are two different refractory periods. One is called the absolute refractory period, where you enter the state of hyperpolarization and you must reach the original resting membrane potential. And another one is called the relative refractory period, where after you go through hyperpolarization, you need more of a stimulus to reach a new depolarization, which would be an increase in, uh, or an increase in resting membrane potential. That being said, let's continue our conversation about action potentials by talking about the concept of potential propagation and saltatory conduction. So action potentials are propagated down the axon when proximal sodium channels open and depolarize the membrane. This induces distal sodium channels to open as well. 
And because of the refractory character of these channels, the action potential can only move in one direction. So the, the sodium channel that opens up here will cause it to open up here, and it'll cause a rapid shift. The arrow's are already drawn, so just follow those. It causes it to move there. And it also causes, it'll also cause another, uh, what is it? Another sodium channel to open up here, moving this way and this way, so on and so on. Now you're noticing that it's covered in what is called the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is a layer of like insulating fat. And the whole purpose of it is to increase the speed of propagation. And another thing that you notice is that there's also depolarized regions that is called the node of Ranvier. This is where the depolarization uh, comes to an apex and it allows for transfer, causing very fast uh, jumps in, uh, in depolarization and jumps in the electrical signal, causing it to propagate very, very quickly. If you don't have the myelin sheath, you won't have nodes of Ranvier. And as a result, your signal will be a lot slower. That being said, this whole process is called saltatory conduction. Now, finally, let's talk about what happens at the synapse. So once an action potential reaches a synapse, it will release signals that allow calcium channels to open up. Once you see calcium channels opening up, there's a lots of calcium entering the cell, and that will cause neurotransmitters to enter vesicles. So all of these are little neurotransmitters, as you can see right here, and they'll enter the vesicles and they'll be uh, prompted to leave via exocytosis. And these neurotransmitters will bind to receptors on the postsynaptic dendrite, causing a new response to occur. Now let's start talking about the nervous system. The nervous system is split off into two different concepts, starting with the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system right here is a bit more straightforward in that it splits off into the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system gets a bit more complicated as it splits off into the somatic nervous system, which is our voluntary movements. That also gets split off into sensory and motor as well as the autonomic nervous system, which will split off into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, I want to point out that the senses that we uh, perceive travel from our sensory nerves, and they travel all the way through, and they enter the dorsal root ganglia. Once they reach the dorsal root ganglia, they'll travel... Okay, I'll draw it. Once they reach the dorsal root ganglia, They all travel up through the brain, up to the brain, and the brain will process it and give an appropriate response, which will then come down and travel through the ventral root to reach the motor neurons. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll make this a bit more clear. I don't want to block any of the important anatomy. But yeah, that's basically how it works. It travels through the spinal cord up, all the way up, and then all the way down, and it'll reach your muscles or glands or whatever you need to create an appropriate response. That being said, let's talk about the autonomic nervous system, starting with the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for our fight or flight response. This means that whenever we're in stress or danger, our sympathetic nervous system will kick in and allow us to mobilize and either fight the, uh, the stressor or run away from it. Usually this will cause us to dilate our pupils. It'll inhibit salivation and digestion. It'll relax your bronchi so that you can increase the amount of air and oxygen that you take in. It'll accelerate your heartbeat, so that way all of the blood will get moving in your body. You'll be much more active. Like I said, it inhibits peristalsis and secretion, so no more digestion. We can worry about that after we're uh, safe. 
Uh, but it does stimulate glucose production and release because you want as much energy as possible when you are fighting or flighting. Uh, obviously, the secretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline, that's the, that's the rush hormones. And inhibits your bladder contraction. Goes along with inhibiting, 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 <laughs> sorry, digestion. An interesting thing that scientists have realized is that it also stimulates orgasm. Maybe, maybe that, maybe that, uh, maybe your body perceives that as a danger or something. I don't know. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is essentially the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. And the response it gives us is essentially rest and digest. When you have, when you're going through the rest and digest response, it's basically the opposite of everything that's happening with the sympathetic nervous system. So your pupils will constrict, you start to salivate a lot more, you don't need to uh, intake as much oxygen, so your bronchioles will, uh, or your bronchi will constrict, uh, heartbeat will slow down because you're going to rest, peristalsis and secretion will increase, you're just going to start digesting a lot more, um, bile release will also occur, and your bladder will contract. So essentially, this is when you are safe, you're relaxed, you want to be peaceful, rest and digest. Sympathetic nervous system, you have to fight or you have to flight. Lastly, I want to talk about an interesting thing called the reflex arc. Sometimes, the re sometimes our senses or we experience something that doesn't go all the way to our brain. This will usually be uh, pain receptors or like an instinctual like knee-jerk response where you feel a very strong uh, stimulus and the impulse will be sent through your uh, arm or whatever your sensory uh, neurons are attached to. It'll cause a muscle contraction that will then, or sorry, sorry, I'm getting, my, I'm getting ahead of myself. It'll travel through the, neur uh, uh, the neuron all the way up to what is called a reflex arc. This usually happens in the spinal cord. Uh, it doesn't go to the brain, it goes directly through it'll pass through what's called an interneuron. Once it goes through the interneuron, it'll create almost like a jerking response. It'll travel very, very quickly all the way to an efferent neuron, and the body will pull it back very rapidly. So in addition to uh, experiencing pain, it can also be like a knee jerk response. You might have experienced that at the doctors. Uh, it could be just random twitches. Basically anything that happens so fast that even you can't uh, process why you're pulling away. That being said, that's all I have for you guys today. This was uh, personally my favorite topic to talk about in biology. I personally just really enjoy the concept of the nervous system. Uh, we discussed neurons and glia, the action potential, propagation and saltatory conduction, and the different types of the nervous system. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, if you don't, if you didn't, feel free to message me. I'll try and uh, clear some stuff up. That being said, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and happy learning.